This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Andy Trudd. I'm the co founder of Rentabilities, and I'm here to talk to you about MD Pops. So I think every uh, presentation needs a good acronym. So it's a uh, minimum viable product on WordPress. Yeah, I forgot the channel. Right? Uh, that's my Twitter handle down there, um, in case you want to follow my tweets. I don't really say much, much of anything good, but uh, you know, I'm just kidding. Um, and I'm also Andy G. Cook all across the internet, so you can search me there. Um, like I said, I'm the co-founder of Rentabilities. I'm the CTO. So I'm going to preface this talk by saying I do not speak often, and I usually code for about eight to ten hours a day. So if my mouth starts moving too quickly for my brain or vice versa, please forgive me. Um, so this is Rentabilities. This is our homepage. We're a rental marketplace where you can rent anything, anywhere, from a local rental merchant anywhere across the United States. Uh, and by things, people always ask me, well, what do you mean things? And I mean stuff. So there's a large inflatable that's about 40 feet. Uh, it's a water slide, you can run on it. Um, we also do a lot of equipment, chairs, tents, bikes, uh, pretty much anything you can buy. You can also rent, there's about 25,000 rental stores. And uh, I've been working on this for about two years full time, uh, like two, two or three more years in various shapes and forms with my co-founder, who's also sitting over there. Um, right, so. Uh, this is the stack we're on, in case you're interested. Uh, how many people, just so I get a general sense, are developers? Okay, and uh, how many people own their own business? All right, and how many people have like a product business? So whether it's like a startup or a product that you sell, or like a plugin or something like that? All right, um, all right so we're on EC2. We're also on Amazon RDS for our database. Uh, we use Sphinx Search, which is uh, pretty slick. And we're also using W3 Total Cache to make sure our site, that our site does not chug. Shameless plug, on October 5th, I think is going to be the final day, we were hosting a pirate party on a boat in Boston that we rented. Uh, we did it last year, it was a ton of fun. Uh, John came, we got Jeff Taylor, who is the co-founder of Monster and Nara DJ, who's, uh, why is this going backwards? Uh, weird. Uh, <laughs> he's a DJ known as Jeffer Tail. Uh, we all dressed up as pirates. We had a great time on a boat for like two hours. Come on out. It's going to be a good time. Uh, we're going to put tickets on sale some, sometime soon. Thousandpirates.com. What's the date? Uh, it's going to be October 5th. That's wrong. Tickets on um, sale this week. Tickets on sale this week. Uh, what is it, like six bucks? Ten. Ten, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, ten and under. And uh, it's going to be October 5th, which is a Friday. Uh, we're pretty sure. Um, so again, thousandpirates.com. Check it out. Okay, uh, how many people have ever like studied the Lean Startup methodology at all or read the Lean Startup book? All right, cool, I'm glad I put this slide in there. Uh, so an MVP is a minimum viable product. Uh, basically the way I think of it is it's the most simple version of your product that solves your customer's problems. Now that does not necessarily have to be a coded product. It could be a database, it could be like movie phone where you call in and you get the movies on the telephone. It doesn't matter as long as it solves their problem. Um, this was popularized by Eric Ries, who is the kind of the, the father of the lean startup movement. Um, so if you haven't read the book, I definitely suggest you check it out. It's the lean startup is what it's called by Eric Ries. Uh, I'm not going to dive into this too much, but um, Here's a good version of an MVP. This was launched in 2004, I think it was, the Facebook.com. You guys heard of Facebook? That's good. Um, this was built in 34 days. Uh, he used three colors, uh, white, blue, and black, because Mark Zuckerberg is colorblind, I believe. Um, you could only have one photo. It was only at one school. He put it up, and it blew up. And the crazy thing was, uh, Mark Zuckerberg didn't really believe in the Facebook when it launched, but they just kept going and going and iterating and iterating, and it grew into the behemoth that it is today. So 34 days, which is kind of a long time. Uh, this is one of my other favorite MVPs, which is Dropbox. This is not the original screenshot. I couldn't find it. But what Drew Housen did was he was on a bus. How many people have heard of Dropbox, by the way? OK, good. Sorry, I have to ask. <laughs> my parents don't know what it is, so no, I'm just kidding. Um, 
So he was on a bus going to New York and forgot his thumb drive and was like, oh. So like any good hacker would, he uh, started typing code and he came up with a file syncing version. But before he actually launched anything, he put a video up on Hacker News and it like, hit the front page, did it on Show HN, which is a community for hackers. And he got like 50,000 signups before he put anything up online, which is nuts. Um, so that was a minimum viable product, which is just a video. He just talked and dubbed it. Uh, it's pretty low budget. I'll try to find it and post the link somewhere. Uh, here's my favorite. This is the original version of Twitter. Notice the green slime logo. It's pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what they're thinking, but uh, they're obviously they obviously uh, are very talented and pulled it off. But anyway, the original version of Twitter. All you could do was tech me text message in tweets, and it just went on a public list. There was no profiles. There was nothing. It was just a list of all what people were doing, and it was like at the ice cream shop. But people loved it, and the people who built it loved it, and then they spread it, and more people loved it. And then they built on top of it product. They built the product on top of it with one feature at a time. Um, so we'll back up here and talk about rentabilities a little. There's some that's hidden. Um, so rentabilities, we started off as a point of sale company for rental stores. So these are like equipment stores, I'm sure you've seen them around, they rent bouncy castles and chainsaws, uh, it's a weird combination, but I can do it. <laughs> children. Um, and, what was that? Exactly, yeah, or a zombie apocalypse. Um, so we were making a point of sale system. We had about 20 customers with the goal of taking all these rental stores that we were bringing online and giving them the ability to take online orders through their own website, through a connected system with their inventory system. And we were like, oh, once we get 1,000 stores, we'll hook them all up and we'll create a huge marketplace and it's going to be awesome. And it was a lot of work and we learned a ton and we were making money, but we weren't at the goal that we wanted to be, which was just a marketplace where you could come on, find what you need to rent, and book it online. So we were like, at an Uno's one night, drinking beers, we were like, man, this point of sale thing's a lot of work. I feel like we can figure out how to bypass this a bit. So we decided to create just the marketplace, and uh, we did it on top of WordPress. And this was the original theme that uh, I found on Theme Forest. I think it was like 25 bucks by uh, the blog out there. Yes, I think he's the only person to hit a million dollars in sales or something on the bars, which is pretty nuts. Um, this is the original theme, and this is the minimum viable product that we launched. Uh, I think I found those button skins somewhere online. I wasn't very great at design at the time. I've gotten a lot better since then. But uh, this was it. All you could do was search products. We launched with about like 400 products from the couple stores that we had all around the country, and we got it up which is awesome when we learned a ton. Um, so that's it. So why did we choose to decide to build on WordPress? Well, for the first reason was we had been building blogs and a few small business websites on WordPress and we knew it. But WordPress is also a framework if you actually think about it. So it's packed with all these features like authentication, uh, so like login, logout, password reset, stuff like that. It has users built in. You can store objects into the users you're after the user meta table. Uh, there's a built-in sales and marketing website, which is not fun in my opinion. You can just spawn it up on top of your theme. You can use the same looking theme if you plan it well. Uh, built-in blog, hell yeah. Uh, <coughs> so that's built in as well. WordPress is pretty good out of the box SEO, so if you don't want to spend a ton of time on it, you're usually okay. Uh, there's a ton of themes, so I think it's probably been plugged like a hundred times here, but Theme Forest is by far and away probably the best theme website I can think of. Pretty much any look you need, you can find it there, and then they also have dynamic ones, so you can match any color. And then uh, there's, a pretty much, there's pretty much a plugin for everything you would ever need. Uh, I like to, they don't have the add-on anymore, but I used to like to say to myself, there's a plugin for that, like the Apple, there's an app for that. Um, so, crazy story. Groupon was actually launched on WordPress. It was, uh, did, how many people know this story? Yes, I was so sure. <laughs> All right, uh, so Groupon actually started as this, as this other service called The Point, which was kind of a spin-off as The Tipping Point. And the whole idea was that you would rally around a cause and say like, we need 50 people to go clean up the park. 
and once you hit 50, you'd all go clean up the park and it would be awesome. But they couldn't get anyone to do it, all right? And so they were like, this sucks. They're in the Trough of Sorrow. They weren't having fun. Trough of Sorrow, yep. And uh, they were like, what can we do? So they decided to do the leanest thing possible, which was like, well, people like buying stuff and getting discounts, right? So they went down to the pizza shop that was in their building and said like, hey, we can get you a new customer. Will you give us the pizza for half off? And they were like, okay. So they spun up a WordPress site they just embedded the point, which they already had, into the WordPress site, branded it Groupon. They didn't even uh, own the domain name <coughs> Groupon at the time, I think. I think it was something else. And uh, they sold 20 Groupons that day. That's probably like the first revenue they brought in, which seems small, but money changing hands is a huge deal whenever you're starting anything. If you can get anyone to pay you anything for what you do, that's sick. So, uh, yeah, this is a quote from Andrew Mason, who's the founder of Groupon. I'm just going to read it aloud because I love it. Uh, All we did was we took a WordPress blog, we skinned it to say Groupon, and then every day we would do a new post with the points embedded. It was totally ghetto. <laughs> so, if it's good enough for Groupon, which is the fastest growing company to ever exist, it's probably good enough for you. And be pal. <laughs> so, before you decide just to go jump in and start building stuff, though, I always tell everyone I talk to who wants to build anything, do some research first. It's so easy to say, like, I'm totally amped, I'm going to stay up all night, get a six pack, build this thing out, and it's probably been done. And it's okay if it's been done, because you might do it differently, but you should at least know about the competition. So one of my craziest stories was I had this idea with my brother in college called Your Face in the Game. And the idea was that you would take a picture of your friend, you would embed it into a flash game, and then you could like play as the character. And I was like, this is going to be huge, and then we'll like, get advertisers, and we'll put your face in the ads, and like, like Red Bull gives you wings, yeah! And I was so pumped. I worked on it for like four months. That's like all I did in my office with no windows, and it, I learned a ton. But one day I remember I was like, I wonder if anyone's doing this. And I looked online, sure enough, there was like five other companies that had done this already, and they were all going nowhere fast, and I was like, but anyway, we built it on top of WordPress, and uh, we launched it. We got like, I don't know, 10,000 plays, and it didn't go anywhere. So I learned a ton. I probably could have learned a lot more had I done a little research first and uh, learned from those mistakes, but it was a good experience. But these are some of the best ways I think you can research. Uh, AngelList, which is basically a social network like Match.com for startups and investors. There is like, I don't know, like 20,000 startups on there now. Uh, go on and see who else is doing this if you're thinking about doing something. Hacker News is a community, like I said, of hackers. Uh, it's based off of Y Combinator. People talk about stuff all the time there. They do these posts called Show HN, which are like weekend projects. Um, go check out there. Google, obviously. Uh, TechCrunch, which is a news publication. Uh, Crunchbase, which is affiliated with TechCrunch, and it's basically another database of startups. Uh, the cool thing about that is if you find one company uh, that does something similar to what you do, there's also a list in the bottom left that says similar companies, which is usually like all of your competitors. Uh, so that's a pretty good way to do some research. Then uh, the App Store, uh, Apple. It's crazy. People build apps and they don't even check what other apps are in the App Store yet. And then uh, Twitter, just do a search. Uh, see if anyone is actually complaining about the problem that you're looking to solve. Another piece of advice that I have is mock up your entire product before you build anything. So uh, there's a ton of mock-up tools. My favorite's called Balsamic. It's uh, basically a wireframing tool. Everything's black and white. It's like big Comic Sans fonts. So you don't get too hung up on the design, the actual colors, and you actually think about the usability of the site. So build out the entire site, come up with the content. Cool thing about this is you don't even have to know how to code to come up with the product to do this. It also works for websites, for your consulting company. It works for a client's website. What you want to do is get people to finalize the content, especially for clients that you're working with. And then they can't say like, well, I wanted it to say that. What were you thinking? Because you're like, no, we agreed on that. So I would definitely say mock up the entire product uh, before you build anything. OK, now into the WordPress stuff. Um, by the way, this talk is not going to be like super developer heavy. But uh, I am a WordPress developer, so if you have questions that are actually development uh, oriented, feel free to ask me anytime during or after the talk. But um, 
I've talked to a lot of people who have built startups uh, on WordPress before, and this is something I piece of feedback I've gotten from everyone is that themes should be for general layout and aesthetics, like colors, and should be low on the functionality. So like you want the simplest theme possible, maybe even 2011 if that's how you want to roll. Um, the reason why this is is because it allows you to move things around and do a lot of different things um, without bogging yourself down in the long run. Uh, so I don't know why I put that in there. Anyway, plugins should be for functionality. Why does this keep going back on me? All right, plugins should be for functionality, and the reason why that is, you can put a piece of code into your site via a plugin, see if it does anything for you. Like, oh well, ratings is going to make us blow up. I'm telling you, let's get some ratings <laughs> on there. Put it up, doesn't do anything, boom, deactivate. It's out of your life, all right? So if you take a theme that has a ton of functionality, built-in ratings, huge gallery, there's like a ton of rollover features and stuff, you're gonna have to do a lot of work pulling all that stuff out as you realize like, hey, that's just bogging down our product and no one knows how to use what we're actually doing. Um, so that's my piece of advice on plugins. Uh, these are some of my recommended plugin plugins for MVPs on WordPress. Uh, I actually spent like four hours going through the plugin repo the other day, uh, and like did a lot of these in uh, in practice here. I'm not gonna show you any actual things, but this one's weird. Every day, custom logging and dashboard. I was kind of skeptical about this one. Then I installed it, and it's slick. Basically, what it allows you to do is customize the entire login. Uh, interface of WordPress, uh, which is awesome because then you don't have just the standard WordPress. So like you do your logo, do your background, which is always really frustrating for me because you always have to like do custom styles and whatnot. This just allows you to do it and get it done. And the reason why you want to get this stuff done is because you want to spend time on your actual product and like all the login and stuff probably doesn't matter that much. Uh, send me user extra fields is a kind of nice one, but it's not like super necessary, but what it does is it allows you to add extra fields to the WordPress uh, login page. So you can add like a password and stuff. I don't highly recommend adding the password to the login page, um, but you can do it. You can also get like first name, last name, email address, and then all that goes right into the WordPress uh, user object. Uh, Peter's login redirect is just one that I used to use when I was a, a noob. Um, it's nice because it just allows you to take custom user levels and then redirect them to specific parts. So you can do like one for the admin, you can do one for everyone under that, one for separate levels. Um, you could also just write your own script for that if you wanted. Uh, adminize, I used to use this one all the time when I worked with my small business clients. Um, you can actually customize the WordPress backend. So you can like put their logo in it and stuff and they get super pumped about that. It's like the little things. Um, it's also nice too because it allows you to hide functionality from specific user levels. And the reason why that's good is because then you can actually use the WordPress uh, backend for specific parts of your, uh, your site if you want to do that. User role editor is cool because uh, it allows you to create custom user roles. So you can make one for like, I don't know, whatever you want. There's like subscriber editor, all the standard ones, but you could make one called like noobs, I don't know. Um, Ultimate SEO uh, is another one that I've, I've never actually used this plugin before, which I shouldn't be saying a lot, but I've gotten a ton of good feedback on it. We use all-in-one SEO because frankly it was the best thing at the time for rentability, and now it's just like baked into the product hardcore and we're not getting rid of it. Um, XML sitemaps is another one. It's the, the sitemap plugin that I use. Um, there might be better ones. I wasn't able to find better ones. I don't know. And then uh, WordPress, WordPress HTTPS. Uh, this is just something that I notice as a developer. I generally don't like to register for sites that don't use SSL, uh, and, like I'm passing my password to it and stuff. This allows you to quickly just get uh, SSL on your site. You also have to obviously um, set it up on your domain and whatnot, but it's a pretty nifty plugin too because it allows you to take specific pages and pass them over SSL really easily. SSL for WordPress is a huge pain. <laughs> okay. This is another thing I've learned through talking with a lot of my friends who build on WordPress. Just because a plugin exists to do it, doesn't mean you should put it on your site. And I did this for your face in the game when I first started. I spent like 
two weeks just taking plugins and being like, oh, we need ratings. I made the first five games, and there was never another game that got added. So like, ratings didn't matter. Uh, I was like, oh, we also need like new games, top games, most played games, all this stuff that I thought we needed. There's plugins for it, so I spent time configuring it. Waste of time. So what you want to do is just choose the plugins that you actually need to make your product work, and then just forget about the rest. And the cool thing about WordPress plugins is you can test them out, see if they make a difference really quick. You know, not really quick, but you obviously test it, and then take them off. So just don't put a ton of plugins into your product in the beginning. Because uh, it's just going to end up being a huge waste of time uh, for configurating and whatnot. All right. Also, pick your battles. You probably don't necessarily need a plugin for everything. So this is actually a plugin that exists. There's like 12 of them, and all it does is hide the admin bar that goes across the top of the site. In the uh, I forget when they launched it in WordPress, but uh, when you're logged in, they have that black admin bar now. You probably don't want that in a lot of your products. Uh, so this is just a quick piece of code that I wrote uh, that hides it in bar, and you don't necessarily need uh, a plugin for everything. If you want to use a plugin, that's fine, but like, like I said, uh, sometimes it's just faster to get it done on your own. Is that return false? Is that a WordPress function? Uh, I, it didn't translate in, uh, what's it called, in PowerPoint or whatever. Oh. Yeah. I'll put the, I'm going to put my slides up too so you can test this out yourself. It totally works. I tested it. <laughs> um, okay, do I have any questions so far? Am I like, just going too fast? Yes? Uh, what do you use to edit copy? Do you use IDFC? Content on our site? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we don't have a ton of copy so you on... don't have to worry about it too much. Yeah, we don't really worry about that too much. Um, just I don't know, does anyone... Edit. What? Just the default editor. Yeah, we just use the default editor most. Um, uh, yeah, we just use the default editor most of the time. Or sometimes if it's like hard coded into the theme file, we just edit it right in the HTML. Uh, yes. Have you heard the plugin Samantha or used it? No, I'm just I'm just gonna uh, also say I'm not like a super expert on plugins. Um, I build a lot of stuff on my own now, which I'm going to get into in like five minutes. But uh, I used to be a lot, a lot uh, more knowledgeable in the plugin department. So no. There was a, a technology person I was working with, and he was concerned that if people use that, it would link words to Wikipedia, that potentially it would uh, drive the traffic to other people's websites and not to the your website. Like, that is. Oh, so you all right? So you oh right? Is that the plugin that automatically links specific yeah. keywords? Yeah. To Wikipedia. yeah. Um, I mean, in my opinion, if you actually think that's going to make your users' lives better, and they actually want to go to the relevant resource, then you're probably not going to get hurt too much uh, by them leaving, because hopefully they're going to remember you or bookmark you or something. Um, I don't have a super good answer on that. What I would say is maybe try installing the plugin, and then measure how many people actually click on the links, and then how many people actually come back, um, and just kind of do it that way is the best answer I would give. You did say you're using uh, WWE3 to put these to put the tab? Yes. Uh, yeah. We have this crazy custom configuration of it, though, because most of our site is based on geolocation. So, like, the rentals that show up in San Francisco are totally different from the rentals that show up in Boston. But, uh, yeah, that's a really good plugin, definitely. You probably get it, so are you using a lot of custom websites? <laughs> so, funny thing about that was, when we started, uh, it didn't really exist, so uh, this is embarrassing, but all of our products are technically just default posts and we don't have any other type. If I could go back and do it again, I would definitely use a custom post type, but it's just, it's too far gone now and uh, I don't have the energy to fix it. We're trying to figure out other stuff. Fix my thing, I think it's probably better not to. Yeah, we would, we would have to uh, rewrite a lot of code to fix that. So. Version two. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just start with the team and then modify the team directly? Uh, yourself or? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump back here. Um, so this was the original theme. Uh, you know, so it had the gallery, it had widgets down the side, a menu on the top. Uh, we ended up just slowly mod modifying it over like two years and iterating on it. So we changed the gallery, 
we added this, we had this like crazy drop down menu for a while that when you hover over it, it showed you all the categories. Uh, we had to modify the single page. So you have your own theme then, you don't go to updates on Expose? No, no. And you don't get used to this, you did this before Kyle Themes, did you? Or yeah, so this was, a, this was a long time ago. This was like two and a half years ago. So WordPress has gotten a lot better and it's moved more in the framework direction uh, for two years ago. Um, yeah, so our theme is basically our own theme now and we do have a bit of legacy code left from this original theme, which goes back to my choose a simple theme because you're going to end up with a ton, if you choose a crazy theme, you're gonna end up with a ton of stuff in your product that you just don't wanna have to deal with later on. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to do a rewrite everything. And you, you just add functions to the theme, you don't uh, write uh, plugins for your site? Um, we write like some, but not a ton. We should make our product more plugin centric. Uh, again, most of our issues aren't on actually building stuff, uh, most of our issues are on figuring out what people want. Um, so that's definitely a problem, which gets me back to. Lessons learned. Uh, these are mostly startup lessons. Um, hopefully everyone here starts their own company someday and has to go through this sadness that is starting their own company and then gets to the end. Uh, so uh, the first lesson I have is prepare for the unexpected. Um, you're, if, whenever you start your own company, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, if you ever start your own product, you never know what's going to happen, your own plug-in, whatever. Whenever you put something out there for other people to to consume, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so some quick examples that I'll tell quickly. Uh, we started off on Linode, which is a hosting company for rent abilities. We ended up getting DDO, DDoS attacked last August, uh, which totally sucked. And Linode kept cutting us off and uh, null routing our server so the site would be down. And they'd be like, sorry. Um, so that was pretty stressful for like a month. So we switched to EC2 and RDS and life is good. So that was unexpected. Uh, another one is when we originally uh, wrote our theme, we built our own custom search function where we'd like check the keywords and check the categories and all this and that. And once we got up above like 200,000 different posts in the post table, totally didn't scale. Uh, and that was a problem. And uh, the crazy thing about that was we were fixing that at like 1 a.m. one time in our office. And unbeknownst to me, I had mono. So I was uh, like super sick, felt like I was gonna die. And we were like, we have to this. And uh, we ended up switching to Sphinx in the long run, and that totally worked out. Um, I was sick for like a month. And uh, the other one that was a total pain too is like we had total problems with SSL on our site, and uh, I won't go into that one in too much detail, but uh, if you ever need a hand with SSL, let me know. Um, another lesson, getting customers is harder than building your product, which brings me back to that, which is most of our problems are not in like, can it be built? In most companies and products, uh, the question is not, can it be built? It's can you get anyone to care and to pay you money for whatever it is that you, you build? So I would say focus like half, maybe less than half of your efforts on getting something up and then focus the bulk of your efforts on actually getting people to come to your site. And I have like a ton of ideas. If you ever want to like buy me a beer or something, uh, on how to help you get customers, but uh, you can just search Twitter, like I said, go on Hacker News, the App Store, you can go on the reviews and like see all the people complaining about it and like try to figure out who they are. Um, there's a ton of different things you can do, you just have to be scrappy about it. Um, you'll throw out a lot of code, this is sad, but it happens. Uh, I throw out code a ton, we test stuff, it doesn't work, I just throw it out, whatever. Um, this is an important one too. Uh, do you things manually first whenever you're building a product or any type of business? Um, the reason why that is is because when you're, you know, trudging into the unknown, you don't necessarily know what people want and what people need, what they're willing to pay for, what they care about. And so you can't really anticipate what you should build when you don't know what, in, what the hell anyone wants. Uh, so if you do things manually first, you'll figure out, okay, this is the process. I'm doing it all manually. It stinks, but now I know exactly what I need to build and then you go build it. Another important thing, talk to your customers. Here are the three, uh, the three tools that we use that really help us a lot. Uh, there's Help Scout, which is a help desk uh, snapping gauge, which is live chat, it pops up. 
our customers love it, and you also figure out what their problems are. And then uh, mouse flow is a screen recording. Uh, whenever someone comes on, it creates a session. You can like watch them as they interact with your site. It's a little creepy, but uh, you learn a ton. <laughs> um, this is another thing too that I, I learned. Uh, measure all things. Measure all the things. We use Mixpanel. It's a metric service. It's pretty easy to set up. We just use the JavaScript API, and it just helps you keep track of whatever you need and you just go through the funnels and stuff. And the uh, final piece of advice is celebrate the wins like a thousand times. Um, this is just important because having your own product or anything, when you put yourself out there and you know, you're know you putting your blood, sweat, and tears into it and no one really cares, it's really demoralizing at first, but whenever you do get a small win, like someone actually downloads your plugin or buys your theme or whatever, you should like go out and buy yourself a beer or take a shot or you know, give yourself a pat on the back because um, that's huge. Putting anything out there and actually completing something is awesome, and everyone should do it. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>